Welcome to Solid Ground Church. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Mike Collins, and I get to be the lead pastor here with this community that is just trying to practice the way of Jesus. So whether it's your first time or it's your hundredth time, we're gonna have a good day today. I'm really excited because we're going to talk about politics. Woohoo! Okay, don't leave, don't leave. I promise it's gonna be a good time. Um, before we get into all that, I just wanna take a moment to celebrate our youth ministry. We got back this week from our winter camp up at Mile High Pines in the beautiful mountains of Southern California. That was wonderful, but even better, our kids got to hear about the love of Jesus Christ and get filled up. And uh, thank you for those of you who sent kids to camp, who uh, thank you to those of you who let us take your kids to camp. And please keep our kids ministry and youth ministry in prayer. And also our kids ministry volunteers and youth ministry volunteers, please pray that they would rest up, they would recuperate, they would be able to feel their legs again. Uh, they would, uh, you know, all those things, you know, just normal youth ministry stuff. Uh, but looking ahead, we have the amazing privilege of partnering with Alta Loma Christian School that is a ministry of our church to teach, my goodness, three years old all the way to eighth grade uh, from a Jesus-centered perspective. And on February 15th, we're having an open house. So if you live in the area and you're looking for a school that teaches from a Christ-centered perspective, we would love to have you come check us out. And please be in prayer for all these families as we are already looking forward to the next school year. I can't wait to see who we get to reach uh, in this next school year. God brings us new families every year where we get to disciple their young ones, but we also interact with their families. And it's such an amazing opportunity to reach the community. So pray with us and believe with us that God is still underneath all this and moving it uh, towards, towards, uh, towards his glory. So, uh, and also, uh, speaking of Alta Loma Christian School and our ministries, those of you who give regularly and give generously, you make this happen. It couldn't happen without you. So thank you. Uh, my dream is that everyone who considers Solid Ground Church their home would be engaged, that 100% of those of you who make this place your home, is engaged. And it doesn't matter about the size of the gift. It's about us moving in the same direction. And the quickest and easiest way to give is at sgbic.com. Uh, you can also send your checks to the office as well. But uh, I like to do that and I like to mention that as we worship because we see it as an act of worship and a response to what God has done for us. And if you're new around here, please feel no pressure or obligation uh, to give. But with that being said, let's prepare our hearts to worship God together. Dear Jesus, in this moment, we ask that your voice would be the loudest in our heads and that you would, you would speak a word of encouragement to us. God, we, we, uh, we, we lay everything else down, put everything else aside, and for these next moments, we are focusing on you. Speak, Lord. We are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. They make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, you are. They make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That is who you Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. The one who made the blind to see is moving here in front of me, moving here in front of me. The one who made the deaf to hear Is silencing my every fear Silencing my every fear I believe in you I believe in you You're the God of miracles I believe in you I believe in you, you're the God of miracles. Oh, you are the one who does impossible. Reaching out to make me whole, reaching out to make me whole. The one who put death in its place, his life is flowing through my veins, his life is flowing through my veins. I believe in you. us in Matthew 19 that with God all things are possible. So today as we sing this, bring your needs to God, boldly ask for a miracle, remind your soul of who God is, His faithfulness, power, and love, and in faith remember, remember that He is
Hello friends and welcome to the first step in a very perilous journey that it could be. Welcome to our, our walk through some dangerous territory. You may have noticed from the splash screen uh, for, this, for this service that we are about to tread into the land of how do we as Christians engage in the political realm and how do we as Christians relate to our governmental authorities. And uh, we're going to, to get into some scripture here. Before we, we get too far down the road, I wanna say a couple of things that, uh, a couple of things we will do, a couple of things we won't do, but also to give you an image, especially when it comes to sermons and politics and, and issues that, that, that scripture speaks to and issues that Jesus speaks to. Uh, I get, especially over the past few years, I get this image of the iceberg where the 10% of, uh, of what you see is, is above water, but most of the iceberg is underneath the water. And as a pastor, especially in the past seven or eight years, I've noticed that people are make, usually make giant assumptions based on what they can hear in this environment, a sermon. And uh, I want to I wanna just let you know that, um, that there's a couple things that, um, that I, I can put you at ease. I'm, uh, so you don't have to like, make these assumptions of what's really under the surface of Mike. What's he really getting at? So first of all, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Um, not allowed to by our denomination, first of all. And I, the way I read the scripture, the scripture wants me to stay out of that. And then second of all, uh, it's like the law of our land. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Uh, and also, my goodness, it is not my intention to persuade everyone towards my point of view when it comes to human politics. And if I did, I, our, our church has a diverse uh, way of looking at the world. Uh, and I don't want to say anything that might be too loud of a voice in your head that would distract you from the most important thing I want you to hear over the next few weeks. The most important thing I want you to hear is that I am endorsing Jesus Christ. I am endorsing Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are, we're not going to talk in this setting about issue, political issues that come up in our country of impeachment, immigration, abortion, those types of things. So if you're wondering what's below the surface, hey, I want us to focus on the big picture and the starting point of how do we relate to our culture? How do we relate to the way our country is organized in this particular time and, and place? And Or if you're around the world, how do you relate in your context? So I want us to explore again how we relate as Jesus followers to government and the political system we live in. So here's a couple of things we will do over the next few weeks. We will stay close to Jesus. We will stay close to scripture. I don't not, I don't, especially when it comes to this territory, I don't wanna make anything up or have original thoughts. I wanna stay close to what Jesus said and close to what the biblical authors uh, instruct us uh, as far as how we move through this world. And I wanna challenge you to prayerfully stay open to what God might say through me. Like I said, I'm not trying to give you my words. I'm hoping that God will speak through me as I bring to you what the scriptures say. And please stay open to maybe your ideas being challenged. Because these days, you may have noticed that far too many people listen, but not really listen. Far too many people speak over someone they disagree with. Far too many people listen merely to respond. But for those of us who've said yes to Jesus, that should not be the way that we live. We should understand one another. We should keep the main thing the main thing and preserve unity even when there isn't uniformity. And today, the heart of this message is this short, simple, core definition of our faith. When I say the main thing, let's keep the main thing the main thing. This is what I'm talking about. 
that's found in the letter of Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And the Apostle Paul writes to this group of Christians, he said, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I love that. That's not this formula. It's not an incantation. Paul is saying, hey, when you make the declaration that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're going to be saved. And here in, in my context, I grew up in church. So when I hear Jesus is Lord, I, there's something in my, in my DNA that is programmed to say, amen. But it's really familiar to me. And it may be that way for you. Maybe for you, you hear that all the time particularly in North America in 2024 in the church, it's not a shocking statement. It's solid ground on Sunday mornings uh, or, or even here on our, on our online campus. We sing that phrase. We may sing that phrase 15 times in one weekend. It's a common lyric that uh, appears in our, in our songs. It's a common theme of our sermons here at solid ground. But... And outside the church culture, we don't say Lord a lot in our culture. Remember my, step, uh, my stepdad's mom, uh, Bernice Moody. She's from Alabama, lived in Alabama all of her life. She'd say, oh, Lord. And I, I'm butchering the Southern accent. So there's maybe a, we, we might say, oh, good Lord, a oh, Lord. But in our conversations to each other, we don't say it a lot. You don't, you know, two guys don't go to coffee going, oh, good morning, my Lord. Oh, how are you, my lord? Uh, those of you, maybe uh, Star Wars, because there's Lord Vader. It's not a common word, unless you're in the sci-fi world. But in the first century, in the ancient world, this word was used. And let me, let me refresh you. There's a little l, lord, and that's more along the lines of sir. It's a, a nice title, monsieur. But it morphed over time into something much more significant that takes a lot, a lot more meaning to unpack with the big L, the Lord. If you go around Rome, even to this day, there'll, there'll be buildings, there'll be coins and, and ancient artifacts around that are inscribed with the word Lord. With the phrase, if you translate from ancient Greek or, or Latin, it'll say things like Lord of Lords. Or on, a, on an ancient Roman temple, you'll, you'll see an inscription uh, to our Lord and Savior. And what they're talking about is a line of people or a family. It's a line of people, the Roman emperors, who became known as the Caesars. And at first, when this started, it was thought that, that when one of these Caesars died, then they would join in the, the pantheon of Roman gods. They would take their place as a god with a little g. But later, some of these Caesars just got tired of that process. And they're like, why don't I just skip that requirement of dying to be a god? I'm going to declare myself a god. And that's how it was in the days of Jesus and the early Christian followers. And in Rome especially, there was one king of kings. In the Roman Empire, there was one lord of the lords. And there was one lord and savior. And then here comes along a convert to the Jewish faith who used to persecute Jesus' followers, had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, mind you, and he changed his tune. And there's one problem. He's writing to these Romans in the scripture we just read that, to say that, that when we declare that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. There's a little problem with that. That declaration in Rome is high treason. Now stick with me. I'm, I'm not trying to poke just Republicans or Democrats or right or left. So I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender here, okay? What if I said Donald Trump and Joe Biden were never president? Be like, huh? And then I followed that up with saying, Jesus has always been president. You just might look at me going, this is weird. <laughs> And you would say, what do you mean by that? And I would say, Jesus is Lord. Who is on the throne of the universe is more important at any given time, at any given place. Jesus is Lord. That's the most important thing. But back in the first century in Rome, 
This statement put your life on the line. In ancient Rome and in, in the Roman Empire, to say anyone other than Caesar is Lord, that, that talk about skin in the game. You were putting your family, your job, your life, your community at risk. You could be killed for this. And here, Paul goes on to, to write to another group of Christians in Philippi and Philippians. This letter, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's stop right there. That is a, a vision of Jesus' leadership. That's how in Jesus' kingdom, that's how he is modeling leadership. And compare that with the ancient Caesars. Caesars said they were God in human form, like Jesus. But unlike Jesus, these Caesars, they grasped at power, moving from, I'll be a God when I die in human form. They're saying, no, I'm God now. And Jesus, who continually, he came with a, a heart to serve and heal and rebuild. Jesus came with an invitation, come follow me. Caesars, if you came in front of a Caesar and you didn't bow down and declare that Caesar is Lord and he's your Lord and Savior, you're killed. And Jesus, by contrast, came as a servant, not only a servant. Jesus allowed himself to be humiliated, executed as a criminal. Talk about a contrast. And here, Paul continues, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Talk about a contrast from Caesar strong-arming people into compliance if there's the least bit of friction. And here, here's Jesus coming as a suffering servant, self-sacrificing love, and then God, the God of the universe, elevates his son to the highest place, the name that's above every name. And when God does that, everyone can't help but bow and declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords. So, if you came before Caesar, and you said some of this stuff Paul was saying, it wouldn't go well for you. So here, in these, just these two scriptures, Paul isn't speaking merely spiritually or metaphorically. This is a, a literal, he's saying, to, in spite of everything that we see, we are, our, our gathering of people, we don't have any political power, we have very little resources, we, you know, they, didn't have, uh, they didn't have a PR team. He's saying something that's very political. And people lost their lives over this issue, saying Jesus Christ is Lord. People died. Think, think human torches. Think people thrown to the lions just for, for saying Jesus is Lord and not taking it back. It's a good reminder to us today. If Jesus is Lord, let's not say it if we don't mean it. Let's... Explore that for a second. If Jesus is Lord, what if that's true? Well, if Jesus is Lord, he deserves our primary loyalty. If Jesus is Lord, he deserves our primary allegiance. So if Jesus is Lord, he's not just our personal guide, like a, like a cool yoga instructor <laughs> that we can be all buddy-buddy with. At the same time, He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, but he's not just this little thing that we can contain or we can choose to take his advice or not, like a, like a cafeteria style kind of, hmm, I like this saying or that. If he's Lord, he's Lord of everything. If Jesus is Lord, he's not first and foremost concerned with our personal comfort. And I wish that were 
Not the case. If Jesus is Lord, he's not merely the the old man upstairs. If Jesus is Lord, he's not merely a good teacher or a prophet like some other religions believed. If Jesus is Lord, he's God incarnate. He's king of the universe. And he deserves our affection. Our Lord Jesus deserves our devotion. And our Lord Jesus deserves our obedience. So if Jesus is Lord, let's not say it if we don't mean it. Or if we've been going on autopilot and we haven't let Jesus be the Lord over every part of our mind, thoughts, actions, words, maybe today is a good time to recalibrate the direction of our life. But based on on those scriptures, here's three implications for us, especially moving into this election cycle and our relationships in our day-to-day lives. So number one, if Jesus is Lord, every good thing must take its place behind Jesus. I mean, if you took a second to list the good things in your life, make a mental list, a lot of us would say family, hopefully. Uh, Or we, we know that family has the potential to be a good thing in our life. It's, if it's not, that's actually a, a wound. But listen to this Jesus uh, teaching from Jesus in Luke chapter 14. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. When I read that, my first reaction is, wow, really? Really, Jesus? Well, yes and no. Back then, rabbis used exaggeration to make a point. The fancy word for it is hyperbole. Here's what Jesus is saying by that. Your love for me is so strong that in comparison, your love for others seems like hate. Because every good thing needs to take its proper place behind Jesus. And what I love about this one statement, what I've come to love about this statement is, in some cases, this actually elevates the place of family. Because some of us might neglect the importance of our family. And some of us, especially those of us who come from a familial-based culture, like first century Israel, may tend to idolize family. And Jesus is saying, to follow me, it means that I'm, my way is first. So Jesus puts it in its proper place. So you don't have to answer this out loud. You don't have to put this in the comments. A question for you to ponder. Is every good thing in your life in its proper place behind Jesus? Your family, your work, your friends, your preferences, are all of your opinions in their proper place behind Jesus? How about your country? How about your candidate? How about your political party? Are they all in their proper place behind Jesus? Now, I'm not not an expert, a research expert, but this is easy to find with a couple Google searches. Uh, People have been wondering about, like sociologists have been wondering about where people get their identity. And it's interesting. In decades past, the answer was people overwhelmingly, especially in America, got their identity from their faith or their religion, gave them a sense of purpose. And when they engaged in the government or relating to the authorities or voting, it was an expression of the values that were already in them. And their priorities of faith were injected into whatever their political engagement was. But over over the decades, there's been a, a tectonic shift. And now, most people look to politics for their identity. They, what matters is if there's an R or a D behind their name. What matters is if they're red or blue, or if they're conservative or liberal. And now, for the most part, people will adjust their religious beliefs to accommodate their political identity. So, 
Another fun question for you. I'm so glad you joined us today. Is my faith really informing my politics? Ask yourself that. Or ask yourself, are my politics dictating my faith? And I know most of us, I would imagine most of us would say, well, of course, of course my faith is what comes first. But really, let's be honest, not religious. And there's no judgment here. This is all, I think this is in our culture to the point where it's the water that we swim in. We may be putting our identity in politics before Jesus without even knowing it. So I know the first reaction is, of course my faith is what comes first. But is it really? There's an author named Wynn Collier. He writes this, I'm watching out for those rare people who do not allow their Christian faith to be subsumed by either a conservative or progressive vision, but who, because Jesus is always a perplexing and disruptive reality, confound all the labels and assumptions all of us have accepted as the facts. What was that, Mike? Okay. Our friend and Christian brother, Tony Evans, really gets to the point and cuts through all of that that I just read. He said, Jesus didn't come to take sides. Jesus came to take over. Boom. There you have it. <laughs> Is every good thing in your life behind Jesus? That's a good question to ask, not just about this area of, of and political engagement, but in all parts of our life. Recalibrate today and put Jesus in his proper place. Second implication, if Jesus is Lord, every bad thing must be done away with. New Testament writers had a long list of things to get rid of. For Jesus followers, if you are if you've never said yes to Jesus, you haven't agreed to this. But for those of us who've made Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives, you go through these scriptures and there's anger and lust and dissension and, and all kinds of impurity, impure thoughts. I mean, letter after letter and all these things that, you know, pick your poison. Jesus, and the reason is that not just to, to make sure that you avoid being naughty. Jesus doesn't want you to be in bondage to anything. Jesus wants you to be in bondage to one thing, him. The only thing that we are in bondage to is Jesus because Jesus is our Lord. Not anything that we drink, not anything that we look at on the internet, not, not even in bondage to the words that come out of our mouth. Those lists of things, don't do this, don't do that, stay away, abstain from that, you know, guard your heart. Those things have no place in the life of a believer. Paul also writes in the book of Colossians chapter two, starting in verse six. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. That's the way of life for a Jesus follower. That's the way to engage in these, in these conversations uh, that, that will come up or whatever comes at us you know, during the story of, of this cycle. It's like we stay, stay true to Jesus and, a, and ask. It's not a trite thing. What would Jesus do? How would Jesus want me to engage this person right in front of me? What kind of good news does Jesus want me to spread on my social media page? Because... In contrast to what Paul just wrote, over the years, Christians have picked up a bad reputation. Some of it's deserved and some of it isn't. A lot of us that are in the solid ground family, I'm not thinking of any one person or saying, hey, you're, you're way out of line here. I'm just, it's a gentle, loving, but strong reminder that let's not be the people who continue to build the reputation of Christians as the sin police for unbelievers. Because election cycles stir that up, and it stirs up so much anxiety, and I, and I appreciate everyone's heart. But I want to point us back towards making sure that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. Making sure that we're looking at the log in our own eyes before we look to the speck in other people's. So for these next months, let's make sure that we spend the most effort when it comes to sin policing, that we're looking 
into our hearts, into our actions, and into our own thoughts. And spend the most effort, if we're going to police anything, surrendering to Jesus and, and looking at our own walk. Third implication, if Jesus is Lord, every consequence must be accepted. And we're going to talk about this uh, a bit more as we, as we go through the next few weeks, so please, uh, please keep coming back. If Jesus is Lord, then every consequence of following him must be accepted. You know, some of these passages we even touched on, uh, the one back where Jesus is saying, you've got to love me so much it looks like you, you hate your family in comparison. Who would do ministry like that? <laughs> doesn't, like, doesn't seem like Jesus was trying to sell people on following him. Uh, I, don't, I haven't read of any emotional altar calls or sales pitches. In fact, a lot of times it looks like Jesus is trying to, to, to scare people off. You know, once the cr crowd is building up, he turns to him and says, oh, by the way, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no place as a follower with like, what? <laughs> I could imagine some of the more uh, uh, savvy, some of the more savvy disciples going, uh, Jesus, you might want to tone it down with that stuff. But Jesus was saying, you know, there's a, there's a, a story he tells right next to the passage we just read. There's a man building a tower. Like before you build something, make sure you count the cost. Before you really say Jesus is Lord, think about what that means. That's here at Solid Ground. We love bringing people to Jesus. But I don't see anywhere in Scripture where God just wants us to make a convert. What we're about is lives that have been changed. When, when people say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You have access to everything. And then we become disciples of Jesus or apprentices that we're following Jesus and we mean it when we say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. So here, just to pick on my own culture, I mean, Southern Californians, we get flustered by a lot of things. I mean, if it's colder than 70 degrees, we're freezing and we're wearing jackets. If it's warmer than 72 degrees, we're hot and we can't wait for winter, we get, you know, we have a very low temperature threshold. And I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. And I, I put myself in that as well. But also Christians, it's easy for us to get flustered and make no mistake about it. If you're looking underneath the iceberg, I do see that our culture is growing more and more hostile to the faith and more and more abrasive with it. I'm not saying that at all. But I think it's interesting that we get so worked up as Jesus followers when we face negative consequences for following him. Because when I read the words of Jesus, what I'm reading is that Jesus assumes that there will be negative consequences for following him. And we're not neg like masochistically looking for, for torture. We're not seeking these out. But it's true. You and I may be labeled a certain way for following Jesus, a closed-minded, bigoted, or whatever, because we're following Jesus. You, you may be called names for following Jesus, but I bristle when that's called persecution, when we think of what our brothers and sisters around the world are facing. That's, that's a bit of a stretch. But here the assumption is, and Jesus said, like, hey, I'm close to you. When he says, blessed are those who are persecuted, he's like, I'm close to you when you're called bad names. I'm close to you when you suffer for following me. And you know what, guys? If Jesus is Lord, we will stay true to Jesus. That's, that's the direction Solid Ground Church is going, no matter what our culture says. No matter whoever's in charge, whatever the elect, elected official is, we're going to follow Jesus no matter what. And if we ever find ourselves choosing between Jesus and something else, we choose Jesus. So if you, in your life, if you're choosing between Jesus and what your boyfriend says, you choose Jesus. If you're choosing between Jesus and what your girlfriend says you should do, you choose Jesus. And it goes on. We choose Jesus over our parents. We choose Jesus over career goals. We choose Jesus over unconditionally supporting whatever country we may live in. Because I want to be on Jesus' side. Nations can make right choices and nations can make wrong choices. 
I want my compass to be set by the word of God, Jesus Christ, and his life and his teachings. We choose Jesus. So, another fun question for you today. Are you willing to face those consequences? Or do you take the, the, the position of the great theologian Meatloaf? I would do anything for love. Ah, but I won't do that. Had to lighten the mood just a little bit. If Jesus is Lord, absolutely nothing is off limits. If Jesus is Lord, he gets to call the shots in your life. So let's go back to this beginning, this familiar phrase, Jesus is Lord. Is he really? Is he really Lord of your life? In the first century, saying Caesar is Lord, absolutely the only option. But remember that Jesus is a different kind of Lord. He gives you a loving invitation. Come, follow me. A loving invitation that says, take up your cross and follow me. This invitation that's couched with, I'll bring you rest, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. This invitation that comes with this promise, John 10, 10, I've come that they may have life and life more abundantly. And you can go back, you can go back today. If you're privileged enough to fly there, you can go to Rome and you can look at all these aging buildings and artifacts that come from a time where you had to say, Caesar is Lord. But the Roman Empire is gone. We have antiques. We have the, the remnants of it. But all around the world today, in different languages, in different cultures, in different sizes, different expressions of the big C church, people all around the world are still saying Jesus is Lord. And by implication, Caesar is not. So let's take a moment to recalibrate our hearts and just ask God to search us. And I'm gonna, I wanna pr say a prayer for you. And, uh, and, and so if you would please just bow your heads, close your eyes and take a couple deep breaths. Dear Lord, we, we open our hearts to you. Would you please search our minds? Would you please search our calendars and our schedules and our screen time? Would you please put everything in its proper place, the good stuff and the bad stuff? God, would you lovingly and graciously reveal to us if there's any offending way in us that would keep us from following you wholeheartedly? God, as we engage the rest of the world, would you please remind us of this perspective, that you are in charge and you still have the whole world in your hands. For everyone that's, that's hurting and broken and everyone that's experiencing loneliness, God, we ask that even in those areas, they would feel you right now and perceive you holding them in your powerful and healing hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, uh, I wanna invite you, uh, especially if you live in the area in Southern California, to, uh, to, to be a part of us in person. Uh, we meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and also, as you hopefully you know by now, online at any time. But when it comes to what scripture says about a lot of these platform issues, we're going along with the National Association of Evangelicals and they've written this wonderful discussion guide called uh, For the Health of the Nation. And it talks about how we engage and how we can talk about some of these issues with brothers and sisters and, and then engage with unbelievers. But I believe those conversations are best face-to-face, -face, not in a chat, not one person talking to you on YouTube. And uh, some of our life groups are going through that discussion and we have that available for you uh, in person. And I highly encourage you to participate in that. And if you don't, if you live far away and you, you don't have a, a Jesus-centered, Bible-believing congregation near you, please, uh, if you need help, we wanna help find one for you. We'll make some phone calls. We'll do a little hustle, a little work, because there's absolutely no substitute for a face-to-face -face relationship with your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. 
And uh, so we'll always be here. We're gonna be here on YouTube uh, for sure, but we wanna make sure that you have a real flesh and blood connection to other people. So until we're together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine down upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.